This episode of Plastic Weekly is brought to you by Kellen Tapley and the rest of my Patreon supporters who help make this show happen by donating a dollar or two each week. I remember meeting Kellen for the first time in Ottawa, having already noticed that his initials were on nearly every route in the gym. Everyone was asking him questions, and he just seemed like the hardest working dude that I'd ever met in the industry. Now that I know him better, I know my initial impression was bang on. Your donation means a lot to me, man. Thanks for helping out. Before we get to the show, a quick reminder that tonight, Thursday, November 30th at Grand River Rocks in Kitchener, the crew down there is hosting a fundraiser for a young man named Ludovic with Duchenne Muscular Dystrophy. It's going to be a fun scramble comp at a top gym with great people for a good cause. It all starts at 6 p.m. It's a day pass plus 15 bucks, or if you remember there already, just the 15 bucks. Uh, it's going to be a great time. I'm going to be there. I hope I'll see you there as well. And my old stomping ground in Burlington has opened up registration for Blockbuster at Climbers Rock, the best bouldering event in Ontario, if you ask me. It all goes down on September, January 13th with fun problems suitable for every age and every ability. But if you want to win your share of the $5,000 prize pool, then make sure you register for the open category right now. They've capped it to 50 registrants for the men's open and 50 for women's open. So head over to climbersrock.com slash blockbuster to get entered. That's climbersrock.com slash blockbuster spelled like the defunct video rental store, but without the K. I can't wait for finals. It's always a wild show. So sign up now. I really don't know how to introduce this episode. It's the last in my series about hold materials, so I can hear a bunch of you, uh, you know, exhaling um, from relief of not having to talk about, you know, material sciences anymore. For those of you that are excited to talk about aluminum footholds, you guys are the true gym rats, much respect. But depending on who you are, the man I interview might mean a lot to you, or you may have never heard of him. If you haven't heard of him, I'll link to an article about him written by Gus Alexandropoulos. I guess I'll just say, when I told Ian Powell about the following interview, he said that back in his day, he thought about today's guest the way that my generation thinks about Adam Andra. I kept the interview on topic, so this isn't a deep dive personal story, but I hope you enjoy at least hearing his voice. Jim Karn from Metolius Climbing, how are you doing today? Good, how are you? Not too bad. Uh, We're going to talk a little bit about uh, your experience using uh, some kind of unorthodox materials in uh, in making climbing holds. Um, But before we get into that, uh, there's a lot of hold shapers that are almost kind of pseudo celebrities and they're fairly public uh, and they spend a lot of time talking about the holds they make. Uh, You're probably not one of those guys. Um, So I just wanted to first get started with, um, you know, your history in hold shaping. Uh, and if you want uh, your climbing history as well, just a really brief idea of, uh, of where you came from. Uh, boy, I've, uh, I've been shaping holds since, um, man, I can't even remember. I started shaping with uh, climate back in, I can't even remember what the year was. Um, I've been shaping for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and I've been climbing for a long time. I mean, I competed on the World Cup for several years. Um, after I stopped doing that, I, uh, did some course setting for a while. I set for a couple X games and, um, a few other comps. So, um, you know, I've got a fair amount of experience. Have you been based uh, in the West Coast of the States for most of that time? Um, well, I lived in Europe for several years while I was doing the World Cup. Um, when I moved back to the States, I lived in Boulder for a while, um, and then I moved to Bend, and I've lived in Bend for um, the last 20-odd years. All right. Uh, well, then, I guess we'll get started. Um, you've been shaping most of, of your career, I guess, with plastic. Um, at what point did you start thinking about materials outside of resin and, and polyurethane? I mean, we've always thought about other materials. Um, you know, we, you know, everybody has played with wood and with natural rock and um, a variety of different resins. Um, and for the most part, nothing outperformed polyester resin until polyurethane. Um, and then, 
you know, everybody's kind of gone with that for, for several years. And, um, and now people are starting to play with a couple other things, but, um, really nothing, nothing is standing out as, you know, that's going to replace polyurethane. I don't think anytime soon. What about, uh, so the reason I'm calling is because you, uh, Metolius came out a couple of years ago with what you guys call these mini tech feet. Uh, and one of your reps came into my gym up here in Canada and dropped off a couple kind of, uh, touting them as this new experiment in, uh, in footholds and they were made out of aluminum. Um, so Metolius, uh, the company that you're working for has a lot of experience with metals when you guys make gear, making cams and protection and, and beaners and all that kind of stuff. So unlike a lot of hold companies, you've, you know, you've got this multidisciplinary background that makes you a bit more familiar with some of these materials. Um, so for, for yourself, I guess I'm wondering is, did you know that because you guys had this experience in aluminum, you decided to shape some holds out of it? Or did you already want to make holds out of aluminum kind of uh, before you realized you had that capability? Um, I don't think that was the process exactly. I mean, we're always looking for ways to make the plastic experience a little bit, um, I guess, better, different and better. Um, and coming from our background, we're always trying to make it I guess mimic rock a little bit better, um, you know, make it a little bit more technical. Plastic seems um, in general a lot less technical than climbing on real rock. Um, and so in this particular case, um, we thought it would be great to have a much more technical foothold. And, and people have always had, you know, for years and years now we've had screw on footholds and there are a lot of durability issues and, and there are some real limitations to how thin you can get them. And so it occurred to us to, you know, give it a try out of aluminum. The, the big um, problem with using aluminum is obviously the expense, but um, we thought we'd give it a try and see if we could get the cost down to a point where it was reasonable and, and see if we could come up with some kind of way to machine it that gave it a reasonable texture. Um, and that's kind of what we came up with. So, you know, they're, they're more expensive, but they're obviously never going to wear out and they're never going to break. Um, so, and they're far and away the, the thinnest footholds that are available. It's a niche product, but it's something that, that right now can't be done any other way. So we thought it was worth, worth doing. When you uh, got into it, like, uh, did you have to consider different types of aluminum or different alloys or different metals? I'm not sure if that was something you had to think about or if you've explored it all. Yeah, I mean, briefly, I mean, basically, you know, strength is not, I mean, almost any aluminum is going to be strong enough for this application. So mostly it was cost and machinability and, you know, what would anodize okay and, you know, what we had readily available, that kind of stuff. So it's not like none of the factors we have to look at in in the other products we make out of aluminum. Okay. The bar is much lower. Uh, so when you're designing these things, uh, are you using a, a CNC system to, to actually create the, the holds? I design them with CAD software, yeah, and, and they're made on CNC machines, yeah. Okay. Um, are there like other other? I'm assuming that's the same process that you use for the for the other uh, products that Metolius makes. Everything I'm guessing is CNC. Right. I, I don't think you can mold uh, with aluminum for a lot of these applications. Is there is there a difference in there? Well, sure, you can mold. I mean, you can you can forge, um, you can cast, you can die cast. I mean, and we considered all those things, but um, in this case, uh, CNC machining ended up working out pretty well. So that's what we went with. Okay. There's a theme in in the holds that you've built where they all kind of uh, um, like striation. I'm, I'm not going to find a good word for this, uh, but people that have yeah, seen sort of them. Layered, yeah. yeah, like a very layered approach, uh, all at these really, really, really thin right angle corners. And that kind of creates a lot of the texture uh, on the holds. I don't think it's the actual anodized uh, layer that creates the texture. I'm guessing you you kind of knew just from the nature of the material that you have to apply the texture within the shape. Um I was curious though if that was kind of a limitation of the of the um the machinery that you were working with uh would it be possible to create uh um I I guess I'll try the word like more refined shapes or or different uh, angles with those holds is that a possibility Well we played around you know the you know, obviously one of the big problems is how do you put texture on aluminum so that it's going <laughs> to work as yeah. a foothold. 
and we played around with a bunch of different ideas. Um, and what we came up with was this, these little steps, um, and we played around with a bunch of different angles for the steps and depths and all kinds of stuff. And this is what seemed to work best, so this is where we started. Um, and in the future, if these sell well enough, you know, we might come out with something that's like a, a bit more of a scallop shape. I don't know if you've seen the screw-on ones. Yeah, I have. Um, or just the bolt-on ones. So, like, one of the screw-on ones is this series of, of blocks. Yeah, it's, it's just the one squares. that kind of stands out, yeah. Yeah, rather than layers. Um, so we have some other ideas for how to generate that sort of texture. Um, and if they sell well enough, we'll start playing with more of that stuff. But um, the layers work really well, um, so that's kind of what we're starting with. Cool. When you were talking about, uh, you know, anodizing these things, um, I don't know much about, you know, what that is, but it's basically, I guess, uh, some process to add a finish and add color to it. When you guys were doing that, first of all, did you feel like it was necessary for the integrity of the product or was it more of, you know, in, in the current world of climbing holds, it obviously has to have color. So was it more of a cosmetic thing where you felt like you had to add uh, a finish or was it a functional uh, question? No, it's pure. It's purely the latter. It's purely that people want colored holds. Okay. Yeah. I. Yeah. They, did, did you they guys? Don't need, they don't need the finish. They don't need the, the anodized finish to to work. Did you struggle with like trying to deal with the whole issue of you know color matching now that that's kind of the the dominant language in in resetting? Right. Um. You know, there are limitations to anodization. Um. You. We knew we would never be able to perfectly color match plastic holds um and so we accepted that you know these are sort of a niche category and um we would get the color um as close as we could and sort of put it out there and see if people would accept it okay um so we talked about aluminum having the advantage of of strength especially when you're dealing with smaller quantities of it uh these holds are really thin and and that gives you that that kind of outdoor experience that we're looking for whereas you know, so much of indoor holds are, are big and thick and that seems to be attractive to a lot of climbers, but it's also a functional thing where you need that extra plastic for it to stand up. Um, you can't do stuff as thin as you do with aluminum. So it has the strength advantage. You mentioned one of the disadvantages was cost. Um, with these holds, you sell them in sets of five and it comes out to, I think it's about, uh, um, on the list price is about $40 American. Um, when you guys are, are dealing with this stuff in, in raw materials, um, like if you were to make an equivalent set of, of plastic holds, do you think you'd be selling that set for probably closer to like about $10? Do you feel like you're dealing with like a kind of a 400% premium with this stuff? Oh man, off the top of my head, I don't know. I think it's, I don't think it's, I didn't think it was quite 400, but it might be pretty close. I mean, it, it depends upon whether you're talking about polyester or polyurethane. I mean, I'm sure it's 400 over polyester, um, but I don't think it's that much over polyurethane. Well, if I if I compare it to polyurethane, I guess another big uh, thing is uh, just the production of these things. Like, how fast can you make these? Um, you know, it's definitely slower. I mean, it's more labor intensive. The raw material is more expensive. Um, you know, everything about them is more expensive. You know, like I said, the, the big upside is that you're never going to break them and you're never going to wear them out. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you think about uh, if you think about that, I mean, they're going to, you know, if you think about them being four times more expensive than a polyurethane hole, they're going to last way more than four times longer. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, I feel like if you made these shapes out of plastic, I probably would have like just drilled a screw straight through it and snapped it in half. Yeah, uh, yeah. if I had made it out of plastic. So yeah. yeah, I mean they're just not viable out of plastic, and and the question is whether people um, want a technical foothold enough to make the compromise, of, you know, make the compromise for the both for the price and for the imperfect color matching. Well, now that you've had these out for, for a couple of years um, and you guys have kind of started to get feedback from them, that's a really good question is, is uh, you know, especially a lot of the people like yourself in the industry today, uh, you come from a, a big history of, you know, you probably started climbing outdoors and that was kind of the, the start of your, your journey through all of this stuff. 
um, a lot of the climbers these days are starting inside and there's definitely a different level of, of friendliness in the, in the size of, of holds and the ergonomics of holds. Do you feel like there is as much of a market for, for these really technical, relatively punishing holds uh, as you may want it to be? You know, that's a big question. Uh, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, I know that when we released these, we got a lot of interest. Um, some people were really excited about them, and other people looked at them and said, you know, why would I ever use that? And that's kind of what we expected. Um, and I think there is a, a population today that doesn't really have any interest in moving from gym climbing to climbing outdoors, and, and that kind of climber probably is not going to be interested in these. But there are still some people who are interested in using um, indoor walls to train for out, outdoor climbing, and I think that population of climbers will probably be interested in this kind of thing. Have you gotten much feedback from like the the competitive side of things? Because I know the you know aside from hard outdoor climbing, the other place you run into awful feet is at you know World Cup level uh, climbing competitions. Um, has there been any, I don't know if anybody's, you know, grabbed a couple of these to take out onto the circuit or do you see them as something that could end up being used there? I think that would be a great use for, I mean, if I was course setting at that level, I would certainly be looking at using these things. Um, I personally haven't gotten that feedback yet. Um, so, you know, I would welcome hearing it for if anybody's using them. My biggest question, uh, talking to everybody about these different materials is, is how far can you take this material idea? So, with the application you have right now, um, it is it is mostly just on small holds. Does does the economy of aluminum or its benefits work if you start making those holds bigger and start turning them into uh, you know hand size shapes uh, or you know almost volume size shapes? Like it it will always be stronger, I think, than plastic. But in terms of weight and in terms of uh, grip and cost, uh, do you feel like you could ever take it to a, a different size? I don't think so. I mean, we immediately considered it, obviously. I mean, as soon as we could have an idea, we try to push it as far as we possibly can. Um, so we immediately considered that, and, and we hacked some prototypes out on the, the hand mill. Um, and I just don't see any advantage. I mean, the texture is, you know, doesn't feel great for your hands. Um, you know, it becomes really expensive really quickly. Um, I, you know, I, I think the this is the right application for this. Um, so I, I don't really see making handholds out of this material, not just in, in footholds, uh, but also in handholds, you know, talking about, you know, Jim's looking for friendly shapes, uh, crimps these days, like for the most part, crimps, it's the same thing where, you know, a really good crimp, a really hard, heinous crimp would need to be extremely thin, uh, for it to, to be what we want it to be. And plastic isn't always perfect for that. You're talking about the hand feel of these things. Um, with some of the, the different shaping techniques that you've been working on, do you think it would be possible to create uh, a functional handhold out of aluminum? I mean, we made some. We made a bunch of crimps out of these, and, you know, it's possible to do. Um, I don't think it offers any advantages over plastic. That's my opinion, in, having, it, having made some and climbed on them. What do you feel like the, the setbacks are? Um. It, uh, you know, you can't get the same kind of porous texture you get when you're molding uh, a shape that you've shaped out of foam. So you either have to have this sort of, you know, machined macro texture, these layers or, or you know, some, some shape that you've machined into it, and that's not very skin friendly, or you leave it flat and it's really skin friendly, but it's it becomes fairly slippery if you sweat on it. Um, yeah, and then there's you know the expense of you know I mean you, you know you, you know how expensive these tiny ones are. Yeah. Um, and you know as soon as you make it bigger, it's it gets that much more expensive. So um, you know we did test that, and I just personally don't see any any reason to do it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so you mentioned that you tried out some other things. Are there like samples floating around out in the world, or are they mostly just like kind of holed up in the shop in a box somewhere? Um, like the handholds and stuff. No, those aren't really out in the world right now. Okay, we, cool. We test them in house, and and there's a chance that there might be some floating around at the local gym. But I think we try to get most of that stuff back. Now, so you guys have done that kind of this big experiment. Feedback's kind of coming in slow. For yourself, uh, do you feel um, 
encouraged to keep going with this or do you feel like, you know, you took the experiment, you, you got it to where you think it can be uh, and you're going to kind of let it rest at this point? You know, it's going to be totally based on sales volume at this point. Um, and if, if the sales volume justifies um, more sets, we'll definitely make more sets. And if it doesn't, we'll just kind of leave leave it at you know what we have. At what point do you think you'll um, uh, know what? Uh, I don't know how how long a window you kind of gauge that over. I would say at, at least three years and maybe more. It, it, okay. It always surprises me how slow sales numbers are to um, to catch up to uh, to a new product. Like you think you're oh, going to really? release a new product and and there's all this excitement and you're going to see a bunch of sales right away and it never ceases to amaze me how two or three years down the road the sales are way stronger than they were the first year on products that are successful so I think I would think probably three to five years before I would really make it just you know make the decision that it's not working yeah do you do you base that experience off of uh, uh, your history with hold sales or, or with the kind of like gear sales or both, mostly I guess. with hold, hold and board sales, and really? really mostly with board sales. Yeah, I, and I think it just takes that long for for everybody to realize that the stuff is out there. Yeah, when you say board, you mean uh, fingerboards? I'm guessing or fingerboards. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, with with fingerboards, uh, uh, fingerboards. I guess like uh, you know, it takes a while before people can kind of get it, you know, into their training scheme. I don't know. I'm assuming most hangboard sales are. Um, our uh, uh, personal purchases rather than facilities. That, that might be a totally incorrect guess. Um, no, that's true, I'm sure. But, uh, but with holds, uh, when you guys put out new stuff, and especially with Metolius, where you know a couple of years ago, there's a really big push to go to, uh, to PU and, and really modernize holds. Um, it, it, what kind of um, initiatives do you take to try and get that stuff out there? Like I know some holds were brought to us and they get spread around and, and try and really push it. Um, so even with a lot of promotion and, you know, a lot of buzz on the internet and trade shows and stuff like that, you find, you know, people aren't finding space in their budgets for that stuff until a couple of years down the road. Well, we just, we don't do a lot of promotion. I mean, a lot of the other hold companies are a lot more um, active with promotion. We sort of yeah. release new products, show it at trade shows, Put it in the literature, give it to our reps, and and that's about it. And and that's probably why it takes longer for our stuff to um to sort of um show in in sales. Um and and that's probably not true for some of the other companies that are more aggressive about promotion. Cool. Well, Jim, thanks a lot for uh, uh for taking time to talk to me about all this aluminum stuff. Uh, best of luck with it, and we might talk to you in the future. But otherwise, uh, have a good one out there in Bend. Great. Thanks. You too. Thanks, Jim. All right. See ya. That's it for this episode of Plastic Weekly. Thanks to Jim Karn for answering my questions, and thanks to you guys for listening. Plastic Weekly is presented and produced by me, Tyler Norton. If you like this, please consider donating a dollar to each episode to my Patreon at patreon.com slash plasticweekly. It helps me start to pay back the equipment costs of this project, and I'll thank you on the show or even send you stickers. Or just leave a review in your podcast app. That really means a lot. Make sure you visit PlasticWeekly.com to find footnotes, references, and other bonus content related to our episodes, including photos of the rejected footholds and crimps that Jim and Metolius decided not to put up for sale. If you want to get in touch with me, you can leave a comment at PlasticWeekly.com and you can follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. You can send me an email to Tyler at PlasticWeekly.com with your comments, concerns, questions, compliments. Just tell me you're out there. Somewhere. Good luck to everybody competing this weekend everywhere across North America. We'll be thinking about you. Talk to you next week. <laughs>